part of Good afternoon, friends and newcomers to our Friday special conversations with special people. I am so happy to introduce our very special guest today, Jeremy Abate, VP and publisher of the Scientific Magazine, a Scientific American magazine, who will speak on the topic, Is Science Communicated Fairly in the Media? Jeremy sent me a brief bio, and because of our time limit, I didn't have the time to list it all but here are just a few of his many accomplishments. He is responsible for developing and executing new media programs and collaborative ventures serving the international opinion leadership that turns to his Scientific American Magazine for the best views of the future. He has spearheaded partnerships with several international organizations, including the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and others and has also led projects serving some of the world's largest corporate organizations, including Colgate, Palmolive, Johnson & Johnson, Caterpillar, and Celgene. He has written articles that appeared in Forbes, Psychology, The Wall Street Journal, and many others. So it's a real gift to have Jeremy here today. And if you wonder how I know him, I work with his lovely wife, Anina, who works part-time as a reference librarian in our library. And after we were talking and she told me about her, what her husband does, I immediately asked her to ask him if he would donate his valuable time to speak to us today. So I am thrilled that you were here, Jeremy. And I have a magazine that it doesn't matter if I hold it up because I don't know if it'll get, but um, I looked up September uh, 2019, a little bit more than a year ago, you had a special issue that said, truth, lies, and uncertainty searching for reality in unreal times. So this is a year later, and I think the cover could be on today too. Um, now it's time to find out what Jeremy's discussion will teach us on his topic, is science communicated fairly in the media? So please let me give a very warm welcome to our very special guest, Jeremy Abate. Thank you. You can hear me okay, Phyllis and everyone? Perfect. Nice. I generally don't like to talk at people or lecture to people. So if there's a way to have people, you know, communicate that they've got a question or want to chime in. I know everyone's on mute just for kind of a technical reasons, but um, I'm certainly happy for people to butt in, make a comment. So, you know, if you feel as you can allow that when you see fit, but we let the speakers speak and then at the end we open it up to questions and that's, then Mike, michael takes care of that anything that, that's perfect sounds great i so thank you phyllis and it sounds like this group has been getting together and you've been running this group for quite some time which is amazing i need to address the funny thing that happened phyllis when we were um trading emails and you asked me to include a little thing about myself my bio cv and then uh, you said, well, it was so long, you didn't really have time to say it all. So I then sent you an email that said, oh, if, there's, if you're short on time and you're just reading this, because I thought it was going on a website, you know, I said to Phyllis, you can just say VP and publisher. But I accidentally, uh, maybe it was an autocorrect, it actually wrote, you can't just <laughs> say VP and publisher. And so I, I looked at the email, I thought, oh, no, she thinks. On this. Thank you for having me. Thanks, everyone. Uh, as noted, I'm the VP and publisher of Scientific American. And, and you know, Phyllis was telling me how long this group has been getting together. We actually are Scientific American. The media brand is celebrating history this year. We started publishing in 1845. Scientific American is actually the oldest continuously published magazine in the country. I say that because there were a few magazines that actually started even before us, but they stopped and started, uh, including Harper's, Town and Country. So we uh, love to you know, uh, use that nugget to talk about our longevity. And we're certainly looking forward to the next 175 years. This year, of course, was gonna be a year of some anniversary events at the uh, California Academy of Sciences. We were going to do an event in London, and as you can imagine, none of that actually happened live. We did do a few virtual events, but because our anniversary officially started August 28th, 
1845. We are going to be celebrating our 175th anniversary up until next August. So there's still time, hopefully. And we hope we can return in some ways to, to live events. Not that we don't love virtual events like this, but I think um, people do enjoy actually networking in person. So like I said, you know, and, and I don't have, though I don't have visuals really, I do, I want to hold up on my camera if anyone is on, this is, this is the first issue of Scientific American published in 1845. Sorry for those on the phone who can't see this, but I'm holding up a broadsheet of a magazine on the cover of which is a railroad car. That was the big story in 1845, innovation uh, on many fronts, but of course, you know, the burgeoning, emerging industry of transit was something on everyone's mind. The other interesting thing is the word scientist and scientific were not used much in 1845. It was also kind of a new, new term to describe a profession. For many years, those who looked at the world and, and studied and codified it were called natural philosophers. So even the term scientific was relatively kind of a cutting edge term when we started publishing. And if you think of, 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 of kind of, you know, the major topics of the day 175 years ago, in addition to um, train cars, there were things like the, again, a burgeoning industry of agricultural technology, seed drills. You know, the big industry uh, back then was of course, you know, this, this early nation that was using innovation to help maximize its agricultural output. We weren't fully, you know, in that kind of U.S. industrial revolution yet. That would happen, you know, a, few, a couple of decades later. But in 1845, our first issue, we, 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 we published, and again, you can't, you can't see this great, but one of the things that we did um, as a magazine I'll, I'll make sure, Phyllis, you've got copies of this for people. But we, we published the, the running list of patents. You know, the patent office is something that um, started in the 1700s, just after the country was born. The first patent officer was actually Thomas Jefferson. And one of the interesting aspects of the Scientific American is we had an editorial office situated in the U.S. Patent Office, one of the biggest remits of what we covered was new inventions, new innovations that we felt were transforming the landscape of mm. American innovation, particularly as it relates to uh, how scientific invention could, could spark you know, economic wealth, health, et cetera. You know, we've always seen in our editorial mission that science is an engine for prosperity, for humanity for economic, you know, an engine of progress. And that was something that was really at the heart and soul of our editorial mission back then. In the, uh, you know, as the years progressed, we, we went, we had editors go over to Edison's home and, and lab, of course, something that's just down the street from all of us in, in, in this area and cover, again, you know, the early days of, of light bulbs, phonographs, etc. So, I, I want to just paint a quick picture of the roots of what it was we were doing as, a, as, a, as an early science magazine was translating inventions, discoveries, innovations for the general public. And it was a pretty critical, um, you know, goal and mission as, as really that wasn't happening anywhere else. So um, that was kind of the fundamental foundation. Now the magazine shifted after the turn of the 20th century to a format that was really letting scientists themselves speak in their own words, certainly through the filter of an editorial staff that you know, allowed them to sp speak to a general public about their work. But it was really about letting scientists speak about what they were doing. And so the modern incarnation of Scientific American really started in the early, the late 1940s, uh, when the editor, then editor Gerard Peel, really turned it into one of these, you know, a monthly magazine that really let scientists talk about their work. To this day, I would say about 60% of our content is written by scientists themselves. 40% 
you know, written by journalists to make that science accessible. So I think that's one of the distinguishing factors of our magazine and our media brand. Like I say magazine, but obviously we're, we're a website. We, we, do, we do work on social media and videos and podcasts. Um, that would really distinguish what we are. We are a vehicle for the public understanding of science. And in so many cases, you know, the voice of scientists themselves. And, and, and that's you know, kind of an exciting place to be because as you can all imagine right now, one of the biggest topics of the day is how we get critical information about healthcare, drug discovery, vaccines. You know, I'll, I'll talk about healthcare for a second because it's, it's clearly on everyone's mind. One of the issues, of course, that we talk about nowadays in, in the media is there are so many channels of media. How can you trust a source? How can you trust uh, uh, you know, uh, any, any type of media platform, whether it's a newspaper, uh, a website, a magazine, the nightly news? How do you trust that the scientific and health-related information you're getting is from a good source? And a hallmark of a legacy media brand like ourselves and something that we're certainly proud of is, you know, our editorial standards are quite rigorous. We don't report on things without the, the, the rigor of checking the accuracy of it and making sure that the way we present scientific information is, is, is fair. Um, something that I think is at the heart of the difference between science journalism and every other kind of journalism is this idea of different points of view in equal time. The very process of science itself is to, is to be neutral, is to let the natural, to, to discover the natural world and report on it and see what works. I mean, the, big, the two big pillars of science, and I'm not trained as a scientist, I'm, I'm, I'm here to uh, manage a title that allows scientists to speak to the general public. But the biggest, two big pillars of science and the scientific method are peer review and reproducibility. And that is an ever-changing world. It's an ever, ever, it's an ever, when done right, the science, the process of science and scientific discovery has a system of checks and balances built into it. Something is true and a fact until something better comes along and disproves it. But when we, we are looking at um, issues like vaccines and climate change um, and the safety of genetically modified foods, that is about you know, testable, reproducible science. And that's what, that's what you know, one communicates. We have to work with reputable sources. It's not just someone's opinion. And, and I think that you know, the idea of fairness in science journalism has never been more relevant. Like you said, Phyllis, you know, the, the issue we did on truth, lies, and uncertainty, and how you could, you could uh, assess the credibility of any information you're getting, it is more relevant than ever as we look at daily, we are looking for information around the safety of our world. It's certainly the health crisis that is upon us, which is unlike any other. And I will say that, you know, the perhaps the silver lining in what has been a devastating global event is that there might be hopefully more permanent attention to where we are getting our facts, where we are, how we are scrutinizing the sources of scientific information. Let me get back to quickly this whole idea of equal time. If you are reporting on a political story, something like, you know, fiscal policy or even a local story of how a city or a town is going to use its resources. You know, of course, you want to give equal time to different points of view. In the world of science journalism, we certainly want to make sure we're getting all points of view, but you know, there, there is a difference. When you are looking at a scientific issue like climate change, or even something, it might sound mundane, you know, fluoride in the water, right? Something, an initiative that was passed you know, uh, many decades ago, and was actually an, an incredibly beneficial public health benefit. Um, you know, <clears throat> most of, though fluoride is in large doses harmful, 
at, at the, the, the levels that it's in public water systems, it has a huge benefit, a huge benefit for, for public health. And so if you were going to do a, a story on that and you had people saying, you know, it's bad for you, I mean, and, and other scientists saying it's good, you need to weigh the amount of scientific voices and the and 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 and, and, and you know where those scientific scientific voices are coming from to assess how much time and you know you're gonna give to that. It's like the old parable that Bill Moyers talks about. The idea of equal time is relevant, but you, you know, are you gonna have a show that says, okay, we've got Mother Teresa for the next half hour and then then a half hour with 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 Mussolini. You know, it just it just doesn't make sense. So in, in the world of 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 this idea of equivalency and false equivalency and looking at how much time you give to quote unquote the other side it is a much more complex landscape in the world of science for years now we have um you know proof that humans are changing the climate and so many media outlets pitch, you know, position it as, well, we're not sure yet. There's kind of equal, equal sides here, and that's just not true. And you could say the same for the safety of vaccines. There was a movement, we called them just, we lumped them together with you know, the idea of anti-vaxxers. And, you know, they don't deserve equal time when it comes to something for which the science the methods of, of vaccines, and this has gone on for decades, proven, proven safe. I mean, it's not to say that vaccines don't have safety issues. It's not to say that, that you know, we're, we're not scrutinizing that. And, and, and to be fair, I think a lot of people that are skeptical of things like new, new health solutions um, and, and, and vaccines in particular, it's not that this comes from necessarily just an anti-science view. People are, of course, concerned about things like taking a child who is 24 months old and subjecting them to something that is a subcutaneous injection of a biological fluid, uh, you know, you, we, we are right to be skeptical. But I think in, in, in some of these instances, that comes from a fear of not, you know, it comes from a place of not knowing the diseases that these have prevented for so long. But getting back to equal time, you know, there might be 1% of, of, of scientists with credible training and background that say, oh, you know, vaccines can be a problem, one, you know, one or below that. And so as, a, as, a, as an editorial media brand whose mission it is to clarify science for the general public, not only do you not have an obligation to give equal time, you have, you have an obligation to make sure that you are not presenting this as, oh, it's an ongoing controversy. Same goes with, with climate change. You know, there are cases in which scientists and experts can disagree on what is valid proof. And I'll give an example. About 10 years ago, maybe eight years ago, there was a lot of talk about how beneficial vitamin D could be for you. And do, do we need more vitamin D? And, and um, there were a few studies, and one study was basically based um, on interventions. One study was just looking at data, subsets of people who some of whom took vitamin D and some of who didn't. So I'm going to read two headlines from major daily national papers, the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. And I believe this was September 8th, 2012. Here's a headline from the New York Times. Extra vitamin D and calcium aren't necessary, report says. That very same day, the Wall Street Journal had a headline that said, triple that vitamin D intake, panel prescribes. Same day, very different messages from those two headlines. Anyone looking at the New York Times would think that, oh, I've, you know, looks like most people have enough vitamin D, maybe some of them are not necessary. Anybody reading the Wall Street Journal would get the quick sense just from that headline that, wow, we are, we are very lacking in vitamin D. You know, the, the point is um, experts can disagree on what, what, is, what constitutes valid proof when it comes to things like nutrition, healthcare, um, the randomized clinical trial, which you give someone an intervention and you have a placebo you know, group that gets the placebo control group. That 
is considered among most experts as the gold standard for is a drug or a supplement working? Is it having an effect? For others, you know, they rely on epidemiological studies, looking at two groups of people. One group that for a certain amount of time has, has taken vitamin D and another that has not. Those two types of studies are enlightening. I mean, the random controlled trial, again, is still, still the gold standard, but for, for, for some, it's enough to look at this epidemiological data. And I just say, I say this because, you know, there are, there are certainly cases and some subject matters for which there is ongoing studies, even when it's an emerging study. I mean, look at everything that's been coming out in the last seven months on drug trials and, and potential curative uh, molecules against COVID. The public is following this like never before. So you're actually getting, a, you're, the general public is, is, is more in tune to messages on emerging clinical trial data than ever before. In a lot of cases, this wouldn't be seen. I mean, you, you just heard last week, you know, a couple of major clinical trials were halted because there were adverse effects from a vaccine. That is actually a very common thing. But um, a lot of the news, even from you know, NBC Nightly News, ABC Nightly News, made it seem like this is such a bad thing. In, 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 some, in, in most cases, this is a good thing. It means that the company that is sponsoring the trials, it means that the, you know, the hospitals for which these trials are going on, they're, they're staying attuned to safety. And I don't know the data yet, but I was just talking to um, a health economist yesterday in most cases, you're going to find that for, for tri clinical trials for which there are these safety concerns and there's halting and then starting up again and then halting and starting up again, those are the trials that you're, you're going to see actual good things happen from. Those are, good, those are going to bear more fruit because they're productive. There's an attention to safety. Um, so I didn't get the, that data yet, but I just think it's interesting, you know, and I, I, when, when, we, when we chat more in a Q&A, where people get their news from, particularly about science and things, you know, like healthcare, climate, energy, has definitely changed. I, I'll go back to, you know, our roots. Back in the 19th century, there were not a huge amount of media titles and places to go for science information. I mean, the entity of scientific discovery, again, was kind of a new thing. But when you think about the 19th century, civil engineering feats, telegraph, you know, communication, like I said, the railroad, these were nuanced science stories. They became much more nuanced in the early 20th century when the focus of the things that we covered as a media brand switched from the civil engineering feats of the 19th century and focused really on what I was just talking about earlier, you know, humanities, war on disease, the birth of antibiotics, um, you know, the, the ability, the, the germ theory of disease certainly changed, you know, everything. I mean, if most people in the medical community consider three things to be the most, the, the most game-changing innovations for human health, and they are antibiotics, they are sanitation, and vaccines still the to this day i mean we've we've had we've, we've had amazing um progress for certain disease categories in 1920 and we covered this obviously as a magazine brand you had insulin that transformed diabetes from what was a death sentence into what it is today which is a chronic manageable disease there have been you know if you look at the, 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 what was then a novel virus in 1981, HIV, you know, that has been, again, transformed into something that is you know, still a horrible disease and, 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 and virus to get, but it's, but it's now, in many cases, manageable long-term. Um, many researchers hope that one day cancer, most, most cases of cancer, could be transformed into that. But this leads me to that idea of bias now. And, and you know, there's different ways in which the science stories you read can be biased. I talked about the idea of equal time. You know, there are, there are some 
media channels that are going to give equal time to anti-vaxxers as they would to someone talking about the promise of vaccine. But there's another kind of bias, and that is certainly the fact that any media is a business in some cases. I mean, you know, we are, we are still, we're not a nonprofit. We are a for-profit media entity. So a media entity has to be very careful into how they position things because we certainly want to educate publics around important scientific ideas and scientific progress. We want to scrutinize those ideas so the public does not get a false sense of, wow, there's this amazing innovation. But at the same time, you have to make sure you are, if, if your mission is to communicate cutting edge science for the public, you need to make sure it gets read and consumed and that your content is engaged with. So how do you do that? Um, you need to make headlines that get things read, but you don't want to be misleading. I mean, that is a constant balance. And it is a balance that happens in every, you know, um, credible newsroom, every credible journalistic outfit is going to need to work, address that, those sometimes conflicting missions with, you want people to, to engage with your content. You want readership. You want to sell magazines, obviously. Do you do that at the expense of trying to make a story more hypey than it should be? I mean, we've always erred on the side of you no, know, but you also want to get people excited. I mean, what is the point of any media? What is the point of journalism? It's certainly different than entertainment, but it has to entertain. You know, if you are trying to sell records or theater tickets, you know, when you're selling art, the idea is to sell something that people can engage with. When you're selling journalism and you're selling fact-based, evidence-based stories and, and reason, it's a little different. You, you have to be very careful of how, how you hype it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the ultimate point of spreading scientific information, credible scientific information is, well, it's multi, there's multiple points, right? You want a public that can appreciate where the world is going and make informed decisions about their lives based on that, whether I'm going to use you know, this type of, whether, whether I'm going to get a hybrid car because I want to be you know, more mindful of, of environmental impact, whether that's going to actually have an impact. So there's the public understanding of science and the action that they can do. Also, a huge part of our readership is policymakers. As we are seeing in real time, unfolding right now, never is it more important than to, 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 to make sure that policymakers have a, a clear and transparent view of good, credible science. You're seeing right now that the White House is toying with this idea of letting a virus take its course so that we can eventually realize what's called herd immunity, uh, with, with, where, where there's a good percentage of the population that's immune, and that helps to, you know, make, uh, uh, you know, get, get us through a, a, a viral pandemic. Well, the, the problem with that is it's going to take a lot of lives in, in its course. It's, a, it's actually very bad science. The, the, the concept of human, herd immunity works, but the method to get there in this case is absolutely absurd. So it's, you know, um, policymakers need to be informed with good science. So you're gonna, you're, you know, they need to read primary papers in reputable journals. And they also certainly need to be, um, you know, following the work of good science journalism that can translate what researchers know and what they can recommend to the general public, uh, et cetera. I would say a third outcome that we certainly love to see is, you know, science journalism exists to inspire people. Uh, as publisher of Scientific American, when I, when I speak or attend events, I get many people saying, you know, it was your media title, it was your magazine that got me, you know, an MD or, or whoever, it, or, 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 or you know, a researcher in energy, got me excited to, to go into this field. So, you know, it is, it is you know, we participated with a few events uh, under the Obama administration, something called Change the Equation, where we tried to, you know, really get, you know, kids interested in science, 
science education is important. I think the scientific media has an obligation to inspire young people from a diverse set of backgrounds globally to want to go into the field. We need to make sure that we can, you know, inspire people. Um, so that's that's a big that's a big important uh, part of it. Um, I would say that again, the media in general has changed so much that is it's it's much easier to to digest a non credible story than it was 20, 30 years ago. You know, in the old days, there was certainly and we could, we could argue with whether it's good or bad. There was a monolithic structure to media. There were three TV networks and then PBS. There were a few major daily papers. There were special interest magazines. Um, there were certainly professional publications that people got you know, for the last many years. But what happened during the, the first digital revolution, and certainly it was a great thing in so many ways, but you know, information became more accessible with the rise of the internet and instantaneous. And the publishing process could, you know, in many ways became more equitable. People could read more things. I mean, the business model of, of publications certainly changed. People started demanding things for free because it was, you know, you could potentially reach any audience digitally and, you know, instantaneously. Again, a good thing, but like everything, there's this Faustian bargain with, um, the bar was lowered for those that wanted to enter the fray of public discourse and media became something that was certainly you know, spreading ideas and starting an online magazine, which is a great thing, certainly, but it was certainly harder and harder to determine what was a credible source of information and what wasn't. And I'm not saying that, you know, just the longevity and a media brand gives you that credibility because you have to constantly be a watchdog of your own editorial sources and your own editorial process. But after the, 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 the birth of the internet, that then became, uh, there was a whole new level of scrutiny that I think audiences and readers had to exercise when making sure what they were reading and digesting was credible. And then after the digital revolution of the mid, early to mid 90s came, of course, early 2000s, mid 2000s, the social media revolution, where you started to, instead of follow media brands, you were following people. You were looking at people and what they deemed, whether it was your friends, a teacher, a colleague, you were looking at what they deemed credible and you were reading that or in, again, digesting that media, sharing it instantaneous with people that, you know, quote unquote, your followers. And that amplified, and I would say put almost on steroids, the um, slippery slope of, of you know, non-credible media that's out there for which, you know, again, we all hear about Facebook amplifying misinformation and, and all these social media platforms. And that, that's a real issue. And we have to kind of step back and say, okay, what are the sources here? Again, I'm speaking to you as a, as with the title publisher of a, of a publishing brand. As soon as the world of social media became so, you know, a, a part of our societal media diet, every brand, no matter who you were, you could be a waffle company, became a publisher. You know, you'd see, you know, on your pretzels, you know, follow us on Facebook or like us something. What does that mean? I mean, why do I need a steady diet of information from every brand I touch. It could be a good thing. It's obviously in many cases a marketing thing. But if I'm reading stories from my waffle company, and I'm also looking at the nightly news, and I'm also reading a newspaper, and I'm also reading Scientific American, hopefully, you know, at what point do you say, well, what do I, what information do I need? What information is there just to entertain? And going to that third bias I'll talk about is certainly information under the you know information that's actually marketing material in disguise of information and that's a big issue in publishing is you are getting information from third parties and again we accept advertising in our magazine we make it clear what material is an ad is an ad and what is an, something that is from the, the editorial board 
in the old days in the world of print magazines, it was very clear what was from the editors and what was real, um, you know, co content that was from the editorial brand and then, you know, advertising content. It was very clear what an ad was. And even on television, you know, it was, it was very clear in the old days. And now it's becoming more hazy. You have something called native advertising where, uh, you know, a marketer puts in content that reads like an editorial story, but is not. We're very clear when we put out material that is from a third party advertiser and so this is from an advertiser, it's not from our media brand. But I, I bring this up because the digital landscape has become fraught with messaging and content that can easily, easily be mistaken for a credible fact-checked editorial story. And that is certainly going to continue. I mean, I think there's been, I would, I'd like to think optimistically, there's a little bit of a maybe backlash to that. And again, if any silver lining will come out of the health, you know, global health crisis we find ourselves in, I think it will be an appreciation for people to say, look, before I read something, you know, who is it, who's sponsoring it? Is it from the media entity that I think is, I've deemed credible? Or is it from a third party I don't know? Is it from a company that has sponsored, you know, uh, uh, this, this message? Those are all valid questions. Again, you know, going back to our brand, we accept money from third parties to sponsor initiatives, whether it's a special magazine, a special report. If it's sponsored, but still from our editors and a third party has paid for it, we will acknowledge their sponsorship. I mean, you've all watched PBS when you see a Ken Burns documentary sponsored by you know, General Motors. General Motors from, you know, PBS is a credible media brand. They're not gonna have a say in that content. They're certainly gonna get ads and acknowledgements. We do the same thing, but there are certainly, you need to be careful when something is sponsored by a third party and make sure that you, know, you, are, you are getting um, a, a piece of content that is not biased toward th the message that you know, Johnson & Johnson wants or IBM. You know, again, credible science media works with a lot of companies that have a stake in science. That's natural and it's okay. I mean, the, the business model of publishing relies on a mix of people buying magazines, people paying for access and third party advertising. I mean, a big part of what I do as a commercial, the chief commercial officer for the magazine is to make sure we have the money to survive, to do what we do. And as such, we need to look at, you know, where's our money coming from? Subscribers newsstand sales, advertisers, sponsors that want to sponsor something, you know, some big idea. Does that big idea help the sponsor? Certainly with, 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 you know, getting them out there. Does it affect the content of whatever we're doing, whether it's a feature story, uh, an event? Um, we, we've got systems in place that will not let that happen, but it does happen. And there are cases of it. There are cases of you know, um, media brands that were putting out things and, and messages and stories that were, you know, more, more for what the sponsor wanted than for the reader. So, you know, it gets back to what is the fundamental core mission of a media brand? It's to inform the public. It's to make sure that the message that they put out to the public has been fact-checked. It's to make sure that they choose sources that are, in fact, representative of you know, the, the facts and, and the latest we know about a certain topic. And if it's a complex topic to make sure there are a diversity of voices. And again, like I said earlier, you know, one of the biggest challenges is to not manufacture controversy. These controversies of, you know, is vaccine safe? Are humans causing climate change? Those are false controversies. And, and any, you know, credible science media outlet is going to need to make sure that they're not you know, fanning the flame of, of, of a public perception. You know, you, so, so, so that, it, those, those processes, that mission, you know, the, the, the infrastructure we have in place is, it's an, it's an ongoing self-correcting process. We've been pretty proud of, of how we've done it. We certainly have 
gotten things wrong. I mean, you know, our anniversary issue, which came out in September, talked about some of the messages we put out over, you know, in, in the last hundred plus years. And were there, were there biases toward, you know, white male scientists? Certainly. Were, were, were there insensitivities to the diversity that should be the scientific enterprise, you know, back in the 1930s, 40s, 50s? Absolutely. But uh, like, like a person, a media brand should be always trying to improve, trying to do better. And um, it, again, I'm not here to, as an ad for Scientific American, but science information has never been more important. And getting it right and, and, and trying to make sure the public has an appreciation for evidence-based thinking and fact-based fact thinking is, you know, that, that, that is the currency with which we will take our planet further and be able to live, work, and play, uh, you know, on, on planet Earth for, for, for the extended future. So, on, you know, appreciating what, how, how science can help that and making citizens feel like they can make informed choices from, from you know, evidence-based ideas is really where, what science media is. And I'm, I'm, you know, proud to be in that position and it certainly has, has again, it's, you know, pitfalls, but absolute benefits. So I'll, I'll stop there, Phyllis, if there's, you know, if you want to pause or. Well, first of all, I just want to tell you, it was fascinating and informative. I love this, the topic. And um, can I just ask the first question? Absolutely. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, when I was young, I, I got the polio shot. I know my parents, they just assumed that if the school was giving it, the doctors are giving it, it's, it's fine. Um, nowadays, I, uh, it's like too much knowledge is a dangerous thing because some of the parents do not want to give vaccines. They don't want to, uh, to take flu shots. It's, it's, um, but I think the, the biggest problem now is, and I, I don't want to sound political, but politics is playing such an important part because science never had to deal with political figures. And usually, you know, it's the one at the top who is going to determine things. I, I know I watched Dr. Fauci and, and I believe him, but then I, it frightens me that some people do not believe in what he's saying. And he has no reason it's, he's not selling himself. He's not even selling a magazine or, or becoming a political figure. So how yeah, do we? Yeah. That? You know, politics always. Politics does you know intersect with science all the time, and um, I wasn't going to dwell on this, but we made the news a few weeks ago because for the first time in 175 years, we've never done this before. We endorsed a candidate for president, and. Um, we endorsed Joe Biden. I'm, I'm sure most people aren't, aren't shocked. And it was, it was a tough decision because again, we are not a political entity that, that, that is in the business of endorsing, but we could not deny the fact that there was so much of a public agenda being set by the very nature of just who, what, what you know, the White House has so much in terms of just setting the national agenda and the ethos for appreciating science. And when you have you know, voices that would be anti-science, you do have to take a stand for it. And I, I, I had to defend this publicly in, in a few different forms and say, it wasn't like we're suddenly taking sides. We're, we, we've always taken the side of science. But I'm glad you brought up polio because, you know, Jonas Salk wrote for us back in the 50s. In fact, it was the first, we were the first entity to publish his paper on, on this, you know, polio vaccine. Again, vaccines always identified as the three biggest, in, you know, game changers in human health and for voices to amplify those that would be skeptical of you know those solutions vaccines or skeptical of experts like dr fauci whom we know and we've done forums with um is it is it is troubling but again you know like most experts i talk to good science will eventually win the day and if you kind of look back at the history of society you're always going to find periods in which scientific, rational scientific voices are trying to be muzzled, and then they rise up. I mean, look at Galileo. Um, we, we, again, a media brand whose mission is it to, to, to 
translate credible science to the public has to take a stand when there are policies in place or political obstacles for people appreciating good science. Doesn't mean we don't want a whole bit different, you know, we, don't, we, we want viewpoints. We, we wanna make sure people that have concerns about new technologies, of course people were scared of, of a new vaccine. People are scared of you know, things that are new, things people put in their body. We have to give that the rigor it deserves, but we also can't hush voices that would be there to, to say there's a huge benefit. In fact, not only a benefit, but we, we ignore science at, at our peril in many cases. Um, so, Thank you. yes. Thank you. <laughs> huge topic, huge topic here. More questions, chime in. Uh, I have a question. I'm Phyllis' son, can you hear me? I sure yeah. can. One thing that uh, got my interest is when you said it's a good thing that there was an interruption in the vaccine trial. And well, I share that. Logically, that makes sense. But as someone, let's say five or six years ago, who didn't read a lot of scientific journals, but just mainstream magazines, I would have thought by now self-driving cars would be common. And it's not. And it's, I think, because there was well-publicized fatalities and isolated incidents that set it back. And I'm afraid that just the public knowledge of a setback in something so important as a trial will, in a, in a vaccine trial, will set it back so that now we don't even hear about self-driving cars. That, that's a great point. When you publicize things that could be bad news, do you taint the, pro, do you taint the, the ultimate product? When people say, I don't want to do that, it's unsafe. I guess in the cases of a vaccine trial, again, you know, the, the sponsors of those trials, the companies that are, that are, that are using, uh, you know, putting forth that innovation, you know, that's a process most people don't necessarily see. It was publicized because we're all waiting on, 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 on pins and needles or bated breath, whatever the expression is, for solutions for something that is a major health crisis. So I think there's a little bit of a difference here, but you raise a good point. You know, we're, we wait for innovations and when we have this perception that it's unsafe, we say, whoa, hold on a minute, I'm not gonna do that. I mean, I think GMO foods might be an example of that you're, you, too. But um, to publicize setbacks isn't a bad thing. I said it was a good thing only to, because it exemplifies the rigor and the attention to safety that has to happen so that when there is a vaccine that has been deemed safe by credible scientists and an, and an FDA that is you know, hopefully not, not beholden to some agenda of a White House, that people do perce perceive it as safe. But you raise a great point that, you know, self-driving cars, is it worth the risk? Um, yes, those were publicized, but that was after the fact of an actual product on the road. It might've been a prototype, but it was, it was wise, A, for media outlets to report that, and B, I think the public has a right to be scared of things that could cause fatalities. But when you look at vaccines, um, there are isolated incidents of reactions, but in general, the I would say billions of lives vaccines have saved over the years and the diseases we don't even think about because they're silent. I mean, here's the biggest thing about vaccines. You take it and nothing happens. And maybe people, maybe that, I'm not gonna say that, that you know, that's the cause of an anti-vax movement, but you, you don't see the benefits. They're invisible because you never get the disease and because society hasn't had to wrestle with the disease. But, it's, but it is a great point I, you know, about, about, you know what, you wanna make sure that people, there's not just a safety perception I'd say in the, in the, in the case of self-driving cars, there's a lot of work to do. And that is a credible reason to, that, that that happened. And at the same time, we've been promised a lot, right? The, human, the mapping of the human genome, I think people had a perception there was gonna be all these cures suddenly for Alzheimer's and other diseases that are intractable and have frustrated the scientific and medical community for years. That hasn't happened too. Has the media played a part in like that? Yes, I think that there's a, you could, you, people are in danger of hyping that because they say, well, this could be, this could finally be the answer to, to, to cancer, to Alzheimer's, and it hasn't happened. So um, we're in danger of overhyping the benefits, but I, I agree, you know, there's some, there's, there's an interesting thing that happens when you, when you sometimes overplay the, the safety issues. Absolutely. Thank you. Great question. Uh, I have a, an observation from the uh, judicial hearing. Um, the a sad moment for me was when uh, Amy Coney Barrett was asked uh, 
by Kamala Harris about, um, um, oh my gosh, I'm sorry, um, climate change, excuse me. And she said, the judge said, that's an opinion. And she couldn't, and she didn't acknowledge it as science such a disappointment and such a reflection of so many issues that we're dealing with now where there is no rigorous investigation and discussion and i just remember having grown up in the 50s the emphasis on um investigating every you know never publishing anything unless it was thoroughly investigated as fact. And as you say, I, I just feel now it's just blown away with things like QAnon and everything and anything just being accepted wholeheartedly and with no factual um, discussion. Yeah. It's, that was a very- I'm hoping we can come moment. back from it. That was a profound moment. For the other thing that, that, that Amy uh, Coney Barrett said was she, she prefaced an, uh, uh, to an answer about climate change with, I'm not a scientist, as if, oh, I, you know, you have to really be in the weeds to understand this nuanced idea. That there's, you know, the fact is, like with evolution, like with climate change, it's not, there's, there's, it's not an argument. It's not, it's not it's, again, this, this idea of a false equivalency, like there's some controversy here. Like it's controversial to say humans are changing the climate. It has been proven. There is no debate here. The debate is how, how long do we have? The debate is if you talk to James Hansen, the father of climate change awareness, you know, he says that there's the melting of Arctic ice happens on an exponential scale, the likes of which we don't even know how fast. It could be much, even faster. And that's not the idea that Mike Pence would say this is climate alarmism is, is, is just absurd. It's, not, it's actually the opposite people are probably more calm than they should be. So I, I agree with you that that represented a sad moment where these messages of there's this false equivalency and you know, oh, I don't know, I'm not a scientist, so I'm just not gonna answer the question. I mean, that, that, that's silly that, that, you know, that's just saying, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not Isaac Newton, but I know that this coffee cup is gonna fall and hit the ground. Um, but I, I appreciate the fact that this, you know, there's this, kind of push and pull and there's there's pushback and you know the arc is not the the arc to better understanding and societal appreciation for science and reason it's not like the arc just goes one way i mean there's times when it gets a little lower but i think in general it rises up i'm optimistic but i i, I share your concern with where are we as an enlightened society that is supposed to rely on fact-based knowledge if someone in that position can make that claim and and, and, and feel like this is, you know, an unsettled science. It is concerning, and I hope that it is a teaching moment for society in general. So what do we do at, as a society to um, arrest, confront, change, um, influence these, uh, I want to say naysayers of science and their ability to truly impact not just their constituencies, but to impact um, the perspective of America based on their um, relatively broad reaching audiences and their perspective overall and their ability to make, it, make a change, to change, influence, and impact how our society, our scientists, our government views the factual world. It's a great question. There's, there's been research, oh, ongoing <clears throat> research on the best way to communicate science to change someone's opinion. And you can't, I think what, what, what the, the ultimate, you know, um, finding is you can't just throw facts at someone and say, change your mind, stupid. You can't do that. And like I said earlier, there's different reasons why people have, might have somewhat anti-science views. It doesn't always come from a place of, you know, I want to, I'm a conspiracy theorist. I want to do harm to the world. I mean, Again, going back to some of the people that were in that, what we've now labeled the anti-vax movement, some of them were, were concerned. I mean, if we could find a common ground, say, look, we're all trying, I think, to make the world a better place, to be safe 
for everyone to have equitable opportunities. I mean, if we can start with that, that's one thing. And then say, instead of just throwing facts, you know, illustrate the point with some stories. Like if we, if you understood more about this work, you know, and, and feel like they're part of it, that's, that's, I think, one of the tactics. I mean, again, those in the science media always trying to, to make it, you know, uh, uh, trying to look to change people's minds or show them this is something, you know, that's understandable and has value and look at the rigor with which was in this. So I don't think it's an easy answer. It's a, it's a great question. I mean, it's, it's, it's perhaps the most fundamental question at how we can engage society in a productive dialogue that is reason-based. But you can't just, you have to pull back from the divisiveness, I think. And and because no one's going to listen. You say, well, it's people that think Anthony Fauci is controlled by aliens and is spewing disinformation. You're not going to change that person's opinion. But if you can talk to someone and say, hey, look, you know, you may have gotten messages that that climate change is all just a big hoax, but let's, let, let's show you why it's not. And, and if you work through those steps, I mean, I think there are ways to do it. I do think it's going to be tough. I think starting kids at an early age of being able to scrutinize them. I didn't have training and I didn't, like my kids are having more, I think, creative ways to think about how do you assess media and its value and prejudice in it. I think that's really great. I think that, you know, young people need to have a sense of like, you know, you know media criticism is something that, that started with like Neil Postman and other, other people in the 70s and the 80s. And the idea that kids are exposed to the idea of how they can evaluate a message is a great thing. You know, rethinking the historical record on how great Columbus was. I mean, all these I think are great. I think it's going to be a wealth of tactics, but ultimately appreciating the value of what science can do for society. And that for the most part, you're dealing with people that are not, they don't have a bad agenda. They're, try, they're trying to help society. And if we can understand them better and elucidate what they're doing and what their mission is, perhaps we can work toward a more collective appreciation for this. But it is no easy task. Oh, you were absolutely wonderful, Jeremy. I can't thank you enough. Um, you thank answered you. This is a great forum. Thank you. And like I say, you have so much, so many accomplishments. And the fact that you donated your time today means so much to me. I do appreciate it. I thank Anina too. Yeah, and, well, it's my pleasure. I don't even know if Anina joined. She's oh, uh, <laughs> I'll tell her how great she's you heard were. Me, she's heard me far too many times. <laughs> um, thank you again, Phyllis. Thanks everyone for joining. This is a great forum. I really appreciate that you do this. And um, you know, it's anyone... 35 years in January. Amazing. And every time I have a speaker like you, I'm so thankful that I have an education while working. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again. This was, this was wonderful. If anyone wants to learn more, I mean, we've got a great website. You can always email me. If anyone's interested in stuff Scientific American's doing. So by all means, you know, um, Give me a call, give me a shout, give me an email. Thank you.